Water. Earth. Fire. Air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then, everything... Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that indoors. Avatar The Last Airbender is one of the greatest animated shows of all time and my favorite TV show ever made. There are only a couple of commandments in the Chase Plays house. VTech shall never create a quality title, the Harry Potter movies are thou better than the books, and thou shall not dislike Avatar. Well, maybe that one. Well, being somewhat of a new fan of the series compared to other people, it's something that I almost immediately connected and fell in love with after watching. And it's an experience that I will never forget. When that intro sequence played for the first time, I knew I was in for a wild ride, and it's like it never wanted me to stop watching. From its incredible cast of fully developed characters, to its stunning animation, intense action sequences, clever writing, and creative and detailed world building, and also being hilarious. The stars sure are beautiful tonight. Too bad you can't see them, Toph. I just stopped myself from watching more of it while I was getting footage. It is the perfect blend of everything I look for in a show and just stories in general. I own two different full series collections for the damn thing and the worst part is I don't regret it. These steelbooks are fucking rad. But something important to remember about Avatar The Last Airbender is the fact that it was a Nickelodeon cartoon from the 2000s and that it was very popular. And in the eyes of video game developers from that time, that can only mean one thing. And you get a game! And you get a game! And you get a a game and why are you getting a game licensed tie-in games how we meet again we have already talked about how this generation of gaming was plagued by the sheer amount of licensed games in the past as long as your system is functional it's getting garfield cart i already have to deal with the fact that i own way too many of these things but when you make a game about tack you know your standards are beneath the earth's crust so of course avatar wasn't going to be an exception to that and had multiple tie-in games across everything you could possibly put it on but i'll give them that making a game about avatar certainly makes more sense than something like ratatouille for example so i do have a little bit more hope than usual. Then again, that might be the reason we ended up with this piece of shit. I mean, while most of them suck, good licensed games do exist as long as you have the patience of a saint to look through them. And hey, if there's a good Avatar game, then I want to know about it. Now, I will be leaving out a few notable entries into the world of Avatar video games. The first one is every one of the handheld ports. Why? Because I'll be here all goddamn day if I covered every version of every one of these games. The same goes for crossover games like Nicktoons Unite. I'm also not going to talk about the Legend of Korra game just because it's actually canon, and that would mean getting into the Legend Legend of Korra, which goes far beyond the scope of this episode. And I'm not going to be talking about that one that came out recently, because if you think I'm spending $60 on this shit, I need to know what kind of cactus juice you're drinking. Also, no movie game, because there is no movie in Bossing Say. As for the ones that do exist, I am curious to see if any of these hold any entertainment value, and uh, well, we gotta start somewhere. First, we have Avatar The Last Airbender for the PlayStation 2, or The Legend of Aang as it's known in Europe. Developed by THQ Nordic, cause of course it was. This company owned a monopoly on licensed games back in the day, so it doesn't surprise me at all they were the ones to take a crack at this. Booting this thing up for the first time, I was mortified. This is a very weird looking title screen. It looks so plain and unfinished. And the loading screens are just extremely zoomed in PNGs of the main characters. The actual in-game presentation is better, but not by a lot. Something about the way they move and talk just isn't right. I mean, it's expressive, but so is a shadow puppet if you move it around enough. See you later, boy! Now going into licensed games, especially from this generation, there's a certain set of expectations. One is that it's going to be a platformer of some kind that condenses and retells the story of the source material with minor changes to suit it being a video game, but not Avatar PS2. This is a dungeon crawling RPG with a completely original story that continues the continuity of the show past season one, since the second season hadn't aired yet. Obviously it's not canon, but it's still enough to get my attention. Taking place directly after the events of the season one finale, we pick back up with Aang still learning waterbending at the North Pole. But after helping out the villagers, the Water Tribe is invaded by Zuko, of all people, who decide to come back to capture Aang. Let's just ignore the fact that Zuko isn't even supposed to have his ship anymore at this point, let alone his own crew, given, you know, they blew up. 
that was kind of a big deal. But I'm not going to ignore that instead of capturing Aang like he came to do, he randomly decides to kidnap Katara and retreats. Zuko, he's right there. What do you want with Katara? So he'll follow you? He's right there! After they rescue Katara from the prison, the gang kind of meanders around for a bit and notices that these Fire Nation machines keep popping up to wreak havoc on the townspeople of different villages. These machines are being made by a girl named Leanne, or the Maker as they call her. At first, they believe that the Fire Nation is forcing her to make these machines, but later after freeing her from prison, they find out that she's making them of her own volition as she harbors a deep hatred for benders and wants to use her machines to destroy them all in order to end the Hundred Year War herself. And then she sticks a giant mech on them that requires benders to operate. One of them is literally a Fire Nation soldier. Like, don't you hate these guys? Aang finally decides he's had enough of this story and enters the Avatar state where he destroys the mech, killing Lian in the process. Damn, okay. And then the gang rides into the sunset completely unfazed by everything that just happened. The fuck? I know it shouldn't matter because it's a video game and a licensed game trying to have a plot that isn't just a retelling of the show is admirable, but that doesn't change the fact that they don't do much of anything with any character. The Fire Nation is barely even a threat after the first hour, and Zuko only shows up three times in the whole game for a couple of seconds and then leaves again. He might as well not even been in the story at all for how little of a role he plays, although it did give me this hilarious moment. I honestly thought they would do more with Leanne, but it's never really explained why she hates Benders, and then she just dies with no development or consequences, like it never happened to begin with, which I understand was probably the point. They just wanted to make something easily ignored by the upcoming season, but you could have done that while not making these guys seem so goddamn incompetent. What did they do to Katara? I don't know what kind of herbal substances the console was wafting into the room, but are you telling me that the badass waterbender who constantly does stuff like this? gets taken down by a single Fire Nation soldier by grabbing her arms? He doesn't even bend anything to do it. Oh no! This line also confuses me. That kitchen utensil had just about the most powerful firebending I've ever seen. Okay, that thing threw a couple of fireballs. Feel like we've seen more impressive shit at this point. Also, it isn't really firebending, it's a machine. Does that make my oven a firebender? Don't you love my firebending? So the story isn't very good. And the sad part is, it was the most enjoyable part of this experience. This game is so fucking boring. As I said, Avatar PS2 is an RPG. You fight enemies to gain experience points, obtain weapons and armor to raise your stats, and complete quests that are given to you by NPCs. But I'll tell you now, this has to be one of the dullest RPGs I have ever played, and I've played Earthbound Beginnings. Your party consists of four characters. Aang, Sokka, Katara, and Haru, as we needed an Earthbender and Toph wasn't a thing yet. Combat is real time. You simply walk up to a group of enemies to engage in a battle. The AI will fight alongside you as the characters you're not playing as. There's no lock-on system or anything like that, so attacks feel kind of aimless and repetitive. It pretty quickly becomes a game of mashing the attack button until everything dies, and that almost always does the trick. You also get more moves as you level up, but the only ones I consistently used were Katara's healing, which I mostly did myself, because when you leave it up to the AI, she might as well be Donald Duck. Sokka's enrage was okay for some extra damage, and some of Aang's endgame airbending moves were pretty broken. Other than that, I mostly stuck to my basic combos, because it's usually faster and doesn't deplete your mana. Every move in this game costs mana, or chi as they call it. But with the insane amount of invincibility frames that enemies have, you're just gonna waste it all and have to go back to your standard attack anyway. So I just cut out the middleman and went to town on the attack button, which was enough to take care of about 90% of threats, and this shit got mind-numbing fast. By the time I was halfway through, my eyes started to glaze over. Once in a while, you will randomly unleash these super moves that deal a fuckload of damage. They're kinda like limit breaks, and when they land, it's super satisfying watching those numbers fly. It's just that they never actually land. They either hit them when they're invincibility frames are active, activate when they're already dead, or just miss them entirely. This happened to me so many times it's comical. But don't worry, even if you find yourself on the losing side of a fight, you can just walk a couple of feet away and wait for your health to come back. And the enemies just let you do this. They never get the idea to pursue you. This is clearly enemy programming from the gods. This is why I never bought anything from the shop, because I never needed potions and the best armor pieces were common drops from enemies. That is until the end of the game where they tell you to go fuck yourself and throw 20 of the most annoying enemies in the game at you. When you only have one party member where they proceed to stunlock you and you fucking die immediately. I don't think anyone playtested this part. Gotta love that soundtrack. <laughs> 
God forbid we get any tunes to make the slog more enjoyable, but I guess complete silence works too. The only sense of challenge comes from the bosses, and that's because they're fucking damage sponges that take forever to kill. Fuck the fight against the Jailer. He has so much health and does nothing but pelt you with fireballs, which drags out the fight even longer. He even has a second phase with even more powerful fire attacks. And if you die, you do it all over again. And the Consular fight might as well be Jailer Part 2. The final boss against Leanne's mech took me, and I'm not even kidding, 20 minutes to beat. That is ridiculously long for a boss fight that's just this. Aside from combat, you're mostly just wandering around different towns and dungeons to find loot and complete quests. You will be consistently running into these areas where you have to use a focus move to either uncover some loot or just to progress, which involves pushing buttons in a set order. These are colossal pace breakers because you have to completely stop what you're doing to do it. They also just clash super hard with everything else you're doing. You're just wandering around the town, your controller starts shaking, and then... Jesus! And I hope you weren't hoping to get anything from the side quests because they're super brain dead. The only reason I did them in the first place is because there are these periods where they force you to complete one or two of them before you can progress in the story. It's almost like they knew if you could skip them, you would. They all amount to an NPC asking you to go to a location on the map, grab the thing, and return to give it to them. Then they ask you to repeat that two or three more times. I'm not kidding that every side quest in this game is just constant fetch quests. And some of them require you to return to the same place multiple times to get different items. Yeah, this game blows. There are some charming aspects. It's cool being able to run around the different locations from the show, and seeing my favorite characters again in an original story with the same voice actors is surely a sight to behold for a licensed game. But there's just not much substance, if any at all. It's dreadfully boring, none of the humor lands, everything takes too long, the story isn't even engaging, and it's just not fun. And it committed the greatest sin of all. There's no Uncle Iroh. So moving on, we have Avatar The Last Airbender The Burning Earth for the Xbox 360. Oh boy, I can't wait to be disappointed in HD. This game is sort of well known in the world of achievement hunters, as there's only five achievements, and you can get them all within five minutes of playing the game just by pressing the B button. Sign of great things to come, clearly. So we're back to a bit of the status quo when it comes to our licensed games. The Burning Earth plot is a condensed retelling of the events of Book 2. I know a lot of people are going to see that as a step back from what was presented last time, and it kind of is. But after the shit show that was the last game, I'm fine with it. It. At least now I can see the jokes they already think are funny in the set pieces from my favorite episodes. The intro does sound like it was written by a six-year-old, though. We have met many people, some friends, and some enemies. And everything isn't quite the same as you remember. Certain story beats have been rearranged or flat out don't happen in the order that they happened originally. For instance, Zuko now shows up in Omashu to fight Aang. Azula shows up in the desert. They fight the Fire Nation and meet up with Jet in the swamp. And the climax doesn't take place in the caverns of Ba Sing Se, but on top of the drill for some reason. But that's not even the weirdest one. They don't lose at the end. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. They blow up the drill and the Earth King congratulates them and they just laugh it off. Shit, how did book two go again? The Earth Kingdom has fallen. Yeah, a little differently. Well, being a much more powerful hardware, it's a big step up from the PS2 game graphically. Environments are much more detailed and smooth, although it struggles to maintain a consistent frame rate. I can understand when there is a lot of enemies on the screen, but sometimes the frame rate drops for no apparent reason, and I don't know why. Listen, I love 60 frames per second as much as the next guy, but if you can't maintain it, just lock it at 30. We can survive. As for the presentation, well, the pre-rendered cutscenes look just fine. Everybody does look like they're made of Play-Doh, but they are animated well and are expressive enough to make the jokes land, so I think it's pretty good. But while the pre-rendered cutscenes look good, the real-time ones, on the other hand, look terrible. They don't open their mouths and they move like marionette dummies given they only have a set of like five animations to use for every cutscene. It's so unnatural and distracting, it's almost as bad as Sonic Adventure. Oh, it's never a dull ride when you're around. The Sokka! Court is now in session. Mr. Peterson, you are being charged with aggravated assault of a federal officer. How do you plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. As you cannot afford an attorney of your own, the court has provided one for you. Hi, I'm Lawyer Chase. Your Honor, my client is an innocent man and I can prove it. Oh my god. How are you doing that? OBJECTION! I didn't even say anything. Your Honor, that's hearsay. I don't think you know what that means. Just put me in jail already. Another closed case for Lawyer Chase.
But the plot isn't the only thing that's back to basics. The gameplay is too. The Burning Earth is a beat-em-up platformer that prioritizes racking up combos. Pretty much all the RPG elements are gone. There are no stats or armor pieces, no experience points, no unlockable moves. You still level up, relatively speaking. But considering you don't gain experience points, I don't know what causes it. The basic combos all involve just pressing the X button a lot and occasionally throwing in the B button. It isn't very complex shit. And the enemies are so mindlessly stupid that they never pose a threat. Once you have fought the first group of enemies, you fought the last one. And that's why I still say the combat isn't that great. I mean, there is a combo system, but it's not like this game is difficult, and you can very much still get away with just mashing the attack button, and it can still get pretty mind-numbing, but at least you're not doing it in complete silence this time around, so that's something. And if I can give the Burning Earth something else, the control is pretty good. Never really had any problems when it came to overshooting jumps or anything like that, and the level design isn't even that bad. I already find myself more engaged than I was with the PS2 game. There's more going on here to keep my mind active and prevent my brain from melting from boredom. They even simplified focus moves to stop them from from horribly breaking the pace. You simply walk up to a spot and push a button. Thank you. That's how it should be. No more. <laughs> Combat is the same idea as before. You'll walk up to a group of enemies and take them out with the AI by your side. But instead of four characters fighting at a time, you get two, which is a strange decision. They all might as well be the same moveset wise. They all have the exact same attacks and combos, so when it comes down to what you want at that moment, what's your favorite color? We do get some more playable characters, including Uncle Iroh, making this automatically better than the last game. You could play as Momo before in these weird sections where they had you sneak around and find hidden items, but here, he can throw hands! He kinda sucks because he's so small it's hard to hit anything, but I appreciate the sentiment. I think my favorite character to play as was Katara. Not really because of anything she can do, but I like her attack animations and I think she has more range than the other characters. Not too sure on that though. I'm very mixed on some of these bosses. They're either piss easy and die in like 2 seconds, or are the complete opposite and take way too fucking long, like the fight against the swamp monster. Maybe we could get this done quicker if Aang could just pick a spot to attack. I'm using this one dipshit! Shit, get your own! Oh, and there are some other parts I couldn't stand. Let's get that straight right now. Hated these sections where you have to figure out where the path is, like in the swamp. This is such a random spike of trial and error that comes out of nowhere. And you move so slowly, it takes forever. They do this again in the desert, but at least the path is more obvious. It just takes a while. Fucking license schemes and flying through rings. I swear this is a thing. They're in cahoots! And escaping the library, where if you come within two miles of the owl, you die and have to do it all over again. The owl himself looks like he's made of three polygons total. This game also incorporates incorporates some puzzle elements. Things like pushing blocks, using air in conjunction with pipes, or pressing switches. It's basic shit. Even something like this wall puzzle that looks intimidating really isn't that hard. Your partner always automatically goes to the correct switch you need, so I can't imagine you'll be stuck for long. You know, this game is not terrible. I mean, I can't see myself replaying it, and I would tell you to play practically any other beat-em-up or hack-and-slash before this, but for a licensed Avatar game, and especially after the last one, you can do a lot worse. It's at least nice to look at. Well, sometimes. And lastly, we have Avatar The Last Airbender Into the Inferno for the Nintendo Wii, which completes all the different consoles. Into the Inferno follows in the footsteps of the previous game. The story is once again a condensed retelling of the events from the series, this time covering Book 3. But it's a much more straightforward version, instead of opting to make each level centered around a specific episode. They even give you a cute world map to fly Appa around in. I like that. I do find the selection here a little interesting, though. I know they couldn't make every episode into a level, but because of that, we jump straight from the Season 3 pilot to the Painted Lady, and then straight to the day of Black Sun. I just think it's funny because it makes Zuko's redemption feel like it comes out of nowhere. It just kind of happens. They should have just made one about the beach, honestly. <laughs> The presentation is easily the best of the three games I've looked at, hands down. For one thing, the mouths move. I can't believe that's something that needs to be said, but it does. It's not incredible, but it does make the cutscenes at least engaging to watch. Some scenes look like they're ripped straight from the show, and I think that's really cool. Being on the Wii does mean the resolution is lower, but that's the game's benefit, because it can hide those imperfections easier and make it feel more natural. Now I say that, but I was originally planning on playing the PS2 version with the intention of avoiding the waggle waggle waggle. But it's very obvious that this game was made with the Wii Remote pointer in mind. There's this new free bending mechanic that allows you to take elements from your surroundings with this cursor and use it to fight enemies and solve puzzles. In the Wii version, it's mapped to the pointer, like a lot of games on the system. But on the PS2, the cursor is still there and controlled with the right analog stick. Very strange and never feels natural, so I decided to switch over to the Wii. Which does result in things feeling a bit more fluid. Part of me is glad that they didn't make an Xbox version because I can only imagine what they might have done with this thing. The free bending is certainly the most interesting part of this game. And I I see the potential. I appreciate them making bending an integral part of the game considering how important it is in the show, but it ends up feeling... 
undercooked is the best way I can describe it. Being on the Wii results in it feeling better than the PS2 port, but it's still never second nature. Whenever you need to move something away from you, my instinct is to move the Wii remote closer to the screen, but that doesn't work. And that habit never really died. Making ice platforms is so finicky, because you have to switch to hold the Wii remote on its side, and then slowly lift it up. Good luck getting it to read those movements consistently. I feel like this could have been made a lot simpler. Combat is relatively the same as the Burning Earth, but with a few changes. They got rid of the combo system, but let's be honest, how much does that really change? Now it just means kill everything in the room. So just like before. You can use the free bending in combat, but it never feels like a predictable tool. In other words, I usually just flail it around the room and that does the trick. It's also just a pace breaker because of how slow you move when bending. You practically have to stand in place whenever you do it, which again, doesn't feel natural. For puzzles, that's fine, but when in combat, it means you're leaving yourself open to being hit, and there's not much to do about it. There's no new playable characters, unfortunately. In fact, there's less than before given the lack of Jet, Momo, or Uncle Iroh. And as much as that's tempting me to throw this out immediately, I'm gonna press on. Aang is automatically the best character given he has access to almost all the different kinds of bending while everybody else gets one. And it also means that Sokka is the worst one. Don't worry, Boomerang, your time will come one of these days. Of the three games, this one had me fighting the camera the most. You can tell these levels weren't exactly built with backtracking in mind, which isn't always a good thing considering the amount of times I got stuck and had no idea what I was supposed to do in order to progress. I guess you can chalk that up to me being a dumbass, but I'm still gonna complain about it. You can upgrade your moves on Ember Island too. I almost didn't even realize that because the game doesn't tell you. It's this little hut off to the side. By the time I did find it, I was halfway through the game. It's not like you really need it though. In fact, there's only three upgrades total. Everything else is just concept art, which I don't give a shit about. Talk about a missed opportunity. This game also has an even stronger focus on puzzles in the Burning Earth. They still aren't complicated or anything, but because they rely on the free bending, it can result in them taking too long or make them frustrating for the wrong reasons. I hated any part that involved transporting fire. It's just so sluggish, and if you fuck it up, you gotta go back and get another flame. It's annoying. This fucking elevator with the flamethrowers and the boiling rock level gave me such a migraine. You gotta get this flame to the top while destroying the fans that will make it go out. Again, I like the idea, but in execution, I want to ram my fist through my monitor, so I can't say it was a slam dunk. You know, I just realized Zuko can make his own fire. Why am I doing this? I'm struggling to find more to say about Into the Inferno, which is both a good and a bad thing. I want to say this is the best of the three, and a lot of ways it is. Feels like the only one that gave an honest effort to be a decent video game in the world of Avatar, and I will give it some credit for that. And I can appreciate it's incredibly short, being only like three hours long, but when that's a positive, I feel like something's wrong. If the free bending was a bit more developed and wasn't as janky, I wouldn't have any issue saying this is the best one. But it's still underwhelming and kind of boring. The Burning Earth is boring too, but it's more straightforward at the very least. If you ask me, the control and level design was just better and more enjoyable. This isn't the worst experience ever, but if you're playing this, it's because it's about Avatar. And even then, there are much better beat-em-ups out there that are more worth your time. If I had to rank them, I would go Burning Earth at the top, Into the Inferno in the middle, and the PS2 game in the depths of hell, where it belongs. Avatar has so much potential for an amazing video game, and it's so sad that nobody wants to take a crack at it other than companies trying to make a quick buck. Bending is such a cool concept, and it needs to be explored in this realm. It would certainly take a lot of effort to get right, but it's certainly not impossible. But then again, this was just a taste into Avatar license games. Trust me, there are plenty left, don't you worry. That is if I don't get through some of the thousands of other license games on this shelf. Ugh, God help me. You know, I can't help but feel like I forgot about something. Hmm. Huh.